All right, welcome everybody uh, to our first virtual butterfly festival. Uh, we kicked it off yesterday evening. We're continuing it this evening and through the rest of the week. Um, just a few housekeeping things. First off, we ask everyone stay muted um, during this presentation. Uh, please feel free to put any questions in the chat. Um, I'll be monitoring that and reading them out loud um, to get answered at the end of the presentation. Um, we do just want to uh, give a shout out to our sponsor, Steel. Um, they've been able, or they've allowed us through that sponsorship to uh, host all kinds of free programs uh, that have an environmental message. Um, in addition to supporting our Wash to Shore Art to Save the Sea exhibit, which is uh, on display now through the rest of October. So definitely encourage you guys to uh, come check that out in person at the garden. Um, but again, just feel free to put those questions in the chat. And without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and turn things over to our host, uh, Maurice Cullen here. So uh, with that, we'll get his screen share up and get this program rolling. All right. Good evening, everyone. Let me go ahead and get things going. <laughs> oh, let's do this. All right. All right. So yeah, tonight, um, hopefully you joined with an interest in, um, you know, hey, what, how can you maybe improve your backyard for uh, attracting butterflies? Uh, and then maybe even thinking about the caterpillars. So for me, that's a, for my yard, that's a big focus for me. So um, go ahead and get this started here. Come on, come on, computer. All right, I may have to stop sharing, go back in. Let's try another one. <laughs> See if this will work. All right, there we go. <laughs> All right, always some kind of glitch. So, um, First, the definition of, of nectar plants. Um, I mean, th that's what's going to be attracting the adult butterfly. So uh, nectar plants uh, supply nectar, you know, whether you're you know, trying to attract hummingbirds or pollinators, um, that's what's important for the adult butterfly. And pretty much anything with a flower, well, that's, you know, that's a nectar source. But there are some nectar sources that tend to be better than others. Um, and again, what I'll be going over some native plants and, and non-native. So, so in my yard, I, I have a mix. Uh, you know, a lot of the gardens that I know of have a, a mixture of, of plants. Um, so, um, you know, again, that's the kind of the focus tonight is, you know, just that variety of nectar plants. So, uh, of course, you know, Queen Anne's lace, and we, a lot of people consider that a weed, but um, uh, I, I can grow it even in some smaller potted areas. Uh, and, and I also maintain a, a pretty sizable uh, butterfly garden or pollinator garden up at a school. And the Queen Anne's lace just grows wild there. So it's a, it's a, a great little plant um, for nectaring. Uh, of course, purple cone flower, uh, one of the, uh, the, good, the good natives, uh, lots of other benefits for using cone flower uh, this time of year. Uh, gold finches will show up and get those little seed heads. So um, good choice for nectar plant. Um, there's button bush, which um, can actually grow pretty large. Um, but when this plant's blooming, um, tiger swallowtails especially, but lots of other swallowtails, the tiger swallowtails uh, tend to really um, show up for this. There's some huge button bushes out at, at the NBG right along one of the lakes there. So um, they, they tend not to mind their feet being wet. Uh, and again, I have a couple of these in a rain garden area up at the um, uh, middle school where I have a, a garden. Uh, pentas, you, if you've been in the butterfly house, you probably have seen pentas inside of there. This is an annual. It's probably one of the few annuals I, I'll have in the picture. Um, but a great plant, um, blooms all summer, seems to be a pretty tough plant, comes in uh, you know, a variety of, of whites, pinks, reds, and um, uh, it's, to me, just a, a great little plant to have around, so um, uh, attractive in, in a couple of different ways. Uh, Lantana, of course, uh, the Chapel Hill is the um, yellow version, uh, tends to stay shorter, uh, it tends to spread a little more as far as dropping seeds um, than the Miss Huff, which will be probably in the next picture, there. the Lantana Miss Huff. Um, in our area, uh, a lot of the Lantanas, a lot of different cultivars, some will survive our winter, it really, probably depends on the severity of the winter. 
um, the, um, you know, for us around here, Lantana uh, tends to stay where it's supposed to be, like say, uh, uh, the Miss, uh, I mean, the, the Miss Huff especially, I mean, it'll get huge, but, um, and, and you might be able to get some, some plants or some small, you know, plants that have taken root there, but um, typically here it is not a problem, but I'll tell you what, states like uh, Florida, Louisiana, um, it's, it can be a problem. So, uh, but for, for our area, I guess with the cold temperatures, it, it tends to be um, a little better at behaving and staying in this place. Sedum, several types of sedum. Uh, what I like about the sedum, um, a later bloomer, um, I always try to have uh, flowers that is something that's constantly blooming so that butterflies show up and they, they kind of know there's a garden there that um, they always have an option, you know, to find that nectar. So uh, I like doing the sedum. Uh, again, it's a short plant too, so it allows you to some, do some, you know, interesting plantings with it. Uh, the blue salvia, they, I think, I believe it's called the black on blue. Um, uh, very attractive to hummingbirds also, um, but uh, a lot of butterflies will come to that. The asters, uh, we have several different types of asters. Uh, again, um, blue salvia tends to bloom quite a while for me. The asters uh, tend to be more of a, you know, a later spring bloom, and, and they, they tend to bloom out, you know, probably by midsummer. Um, so, Fennel, uh, I mean, aside, we'll hear a little more about that being the food plant for black swallowtails, but um, the, the fennel, um, before I had discovered mountain mint, this was like, man, this is like a pollinator magnet. Um, it, it still is, but uh, wow, mountain mint, and we'll see that in a little bit, it's, it's just phenomenal. Um, Budlia, butterfly bush, um, there's a lot of different cultivars. The only I grow this in a pot in my yard. Um, it, it can be classified as invasive. Um, so I, I don't typically plant, you know, the taller plants. Uh, I have one of the shorter new types um, and I, I haven't, I've got two of them. And I actually, I actually did put one in a small garden this year, but uh, I haven't, again, I haven't seen any trouble with it, but apparently in other areas, butterfly bush can be a, a problem. Joe pie weed, a great native. Um, lots of different um, sizes of Joe pie. You can get like you know baby Joe. Um, some of these some of these uh, grow you know two to three feet, while others will grow you know six feet or more. Um, but again, it's a it's a, a huge uh, mass of flowers. Uh, tend to bloom for a pretty good while um, into the fall. You can actually um, they bloomed out, cut them back, and you may even get some smaller blooms again. Um, so it's um, a good thing to not be afraid to cut back some of these plants. Uh, so Joe Pye, um, I'm basically deadheading a lot of what I have now, um, but then um, some of them will have some smaller bracts down there that are going to have some blooms on them. Bone set, I, I like bone set. Uh, that's a close up, of course, of, of bone set. Um, nice uh, whitish color. There's a couple different um, varieties. We do have a, a more of a native type. Uh, I've got a, more of a native type and a, and a really tall type at one of the gardens. Um, again, it's a, um, a later bloomer. Um, so like even in the past uh, two weeks, the bone set's been blooming pretty well. Uh, lots of different um, butterflies will show up to that along with all kinds of other pollinators. So uh, bone set, uh, always like that as an extra fall type flower. Uh, Brazilian verbena, they have actually, um, the first varieties of these that came out were very tall, uh, would tend to blow over a little bit, uh, they had very skinny um, stems there uh, with those um, nice little clusters of flowers, um, uh, but again, attractive to, this is, a, this is actually a melanistic female tiger swallowtail, um, but uh, an interesting plant to have, the, the newer varieties, uh, there's one called lollipop, that's actually um, a dwarf. So I don't think it gets much more than 24, 36 inches. And that's still gonna have that skinny stem with those stalk, um, nice little cluster of flowers. So. Yeah, some more, a good variety, of course, Monarda, Bee Balm, a lot of people are familiar with that. Um, spreads, but it's easy enough to, you know, dig up, share with your neighbors. Um, I see lots of um, smaller uh, butterflies on there. Of course, zinnias, um, 
one of the other, like say, few annuals that I have in here, but zinnia is, uh, it's, it's quite the butterfly magnet. Um, a lot of the ones I'm seeing now still blooming heavily that probably started blooming in midsummer. And um, of course, bees, butterflies, lots of things will, um, will go to the zinnias. Uh, they, they tend to reseed themselves, so you may even have to be uh, kind of weeding some out if you, you know, had a bed of zinnias in. Um, but again, uh, nice little, there, again, there's lots of varieties. I, I like the taller ones. Butterflies tend to a lot of times like to land and kind of, you know, have a little space to, to look around. Um, and so I, I usually have the ones that are probably in that uh, 30, 36 inch range. And there's, of course, the mountain mint. You know, it, it doesn't doesn't look like much, but uh, there's these little kind of purplish flowers on there. Um, and apparently the insects can just pick up that nectar scent. Um, I don't always see a lot of larger butterflies, but a lot of butterflies like hair streaks and skippers, um, very attracted to the, the mountain. And of course, lots and lots of pollinators. So I've, I've seen um, lots, of, uh, lots of honeybees this year, actually. Uh, but lots of our uh, native uh, bees, wasps, flies will go to the mountain mint. I uh, got a little video here. This was um, on fennel. So let me see if I can remove it that way. Click the wrong thing here. So you can kind of just see all these pollinators there. And you can do that with mountain men. I always like to describe mountain men as a tornado of pollinators. <laughs> I mean, uh, it can get pretty busy at times. So, um, and so now let's talk about host plants. Um, host plants, well, this is what you need for the caterpillars of the butterflies. So a butterfly is gonna come you know, to any, any flower and, and get nectar but to lay their eggs and for your caterpillars to survive, um, they're very picky about their host plants. Um, so these are the plants that the caterpillars are gonna need. And for a lot of uh, species of, of butterfly uh, and moth, uh, many will just feed on you know, one or two types of plants. So let's go ahead and take a look at our host plants. Of course, the monarch butterfly, uh, is milkweed. So anything in that milkweed family, um, they will they will feed on. These are just some examples of, of the monarch for you. Okay, that's not milkweed. The first picture is joe pie, which can be mistaken for milkweed because of the color of the flower. Uh, but that's just a nice shot of the monarch there. All right, but these are the uh, different types of milkweed. Uh, swamp milkweed, a couple of different uh, variations in color. Um, so the, uh, the top one is called like ice ballet. Uh, so a lot of them will have a little, you know, uh, common name. Um, and then the, there's uh, some pinker versions and purpler versions. So for the swamp milkweed, um, I like the swamp milkweed. That's also the one pictured in the center there. Um, and you can see this, and this was all just in naturally taken in a garden. So uh, good, big, fat, healthy. <laughs> monarch caterpillars on that milkweed there, uh, which they'll do, they will strip it, of course. It won't take them too long when they get to that size. Um, but that's a swamp milkweed. Uh, I, like, I like swamp milkweed, you know, personally, it's um, probably, probably my, my, my favorite because it, it does kind of stay where you put it. Um, you know, it has the nice, you know, purplish pinkish bloom like the common milkweed, um, but it's um, a little more controllable depending on what kind of yard you have. Of course, the top right, um, that's tuberosa or what we call butterfly weed. It's typically going to be that orange color. Uh, I have seen um, a variety of colors or shades of orange, even yellow. Uh, I've got one one time, I said, oh, I'm gonna buy this yellow milkweed. And, uh, can't wait to you know, have it come back the next year. Came back the next year, it was orange. So, <laughs> so uh, it's not always a predictor of what your bloom will be. But, um, and then of course, at the bottom, that's the common milkweed. Uh, grows very tall. For people that are raising monarchs, the common milkweed, you know, it has a nice big leaf on it, so um, it, it, it goes a little further for feeding many times. Um, but common milkweed, uh, being a native, we don't 
we don't say it's invasive. We say, well, it's an aggressive native um, because it's one of those plants that it's going to have rhizomes, you know, be crawling underneath of the soil there and uh, pop up in places that you're least expecting it. Um, so, and that's kind of why I, I like the swamp. Of course, finding the eggs, uh, monarch eggs, easy enough to spot. Once you start looking, if you learn, you know, if you're, if you're interested in, in, in raising a few caterpillars, uh, or even just finding them in your yard. You don't have to. You don't have to raise them. You know, you can find them. Although you, we'll, we'll talk about a, uh, some of the problems you can have. You know, with caterpillars, you you'll see them one day and they'll be gone the next. But um, the the monarchs, a lot of times, they'll lay eggs in the in the buds in the blooms. Um, they, uh, you know, there's a picture of one at the top middle center there. You know, laying laying eggs right there. Uh, I'll go through and I'll just harvest a few. I I like to. Uh, raise them in the classroom. So a lot of times I'll just raise a few and um, go through and I'll cut, cut the egg off the leaf like that. I'm not, I don't take the whole leaf and you know, leave that for whatever's feeding there. Uh, and you can see a close up on that far and there's a little, little aphid there, all right? So those oleander aphids are you know, on milkweed all the time. Um, but it's that tiny little white egg uh, and a close up inside the bud there. So typically they are gonna lay their eggs on, on a leaf. And most of the time it's on the underside. But here's early, what we call an instar. An instar uh, for, most, um, for most of the caterpillars, the instars, uh, there's, there's usually five instars. Uh, so, you know, they hatch, they're in the first instar and then they have to molt. So being an, an insect like that, in that larval stage, they're gonna molt to be able to grow. Um, and so each time they molt, then we say they're now in a, a next instar. So they can grow, that skin's, uh, you know, stretchy. And uh, so they grow a bit and then eventually they've, they've got to molt again. And so, uh, and then for monarchs, they're gonna go into that fifth instar and be a pretty good sized caterpillar. You can see some of the, the tiny little caterpillars here. And of course, um, sometimes I'll go out, collect some uh, late instar ones and um, you know, raise them. If I'm if I'm going to try and do a little bit of tagging or do a uh, uh, presentation with it, then that's you know I'll, I'll go out and gather some nice big healthy ones and, and raise them a little bit. So, and you can see there's kind of a combination there, uh, mostly swamp milkweed with those nice big ones there. But I, I do have some on the common, and actually all the way over to the right, that's uh, tuberosa at the top. So, uh, and all these were just taken you know naturally. So. And of course, uh, a lot of people focus on the, the monarch um, and of course, or the black swallowtail. You know, when they're planting for caterpillars or thinking about, you know, watching caterpillars in their backyard, um, they're, they're pretty easy, common enough, certainly. Um, and so, but the black swallowtail will feed on several related plants that it has to be in that, like, you know, carrot family, dill family. Um, so for those, um, several different plant options, um, fennel, parsley, it, believe it or not, Queen Anne's lace is a, a food plant, a host plant for the black swallowtail caterpillar. Uh, they will feed on root, uh, dill, carrot. So, um, you know, lots of um, options uh, in, in that herb uh, family and carrot family. So, but they're all host plants for the Eastern black swallowtail. Of course, all those were introduced plants um, let's see, my screen is frozen here, so, come on, again, I apologize for slowness of the computer here, let's see if it's going to move, there we go, all right, and of course, there's what we call Golden Alexander or Zizia, that should be 1Z, by the way, uh, I got to fix that slide. <laughs> So it's Z-I-Z-I-A, it's Zizia. Uh, but that's, um, that's a native and uh, they'll feed on that. You know, if, if, um, it, a lot of times they'll kind of opt for uh, fennel, some of the other uh, plants uh, and they kind of ignore the Zizia, but there, there will come a time where they'll, you, you'll find them on there. Um, and certainly if they're running out of one of those other plants, they'll, they'll go right over to the Zizia and they'll begin eating it. So we just had a, a recent plant sale and then uh, Zizia came in from 
uh, one of the nursery suppliers and there were black swallowtail cats on, on every one of them. So great plant. So, and it's a native. So if, if that's what's interesting you, or, you know, interest you to put in there, then here's an option for you. So beautiful butterfly. Um, lots of neat uh, shots here of the black swallowtail. Uh, let's see, I think a little video here showing the Oz material, if you're not familiar with those. So if an, if an insect were coming along trying to take that wasp away, you know, they'll pop those Oz materium out. Uh, they smell awful. I'm sure they leave an awful taste uh, to that, you know, if there were a bird or something bothering it. Um, although, you know, if it's uh, too much damage, it won't survive. But it is a, a defense mechanism for them that um, it's kind of a little hidden there. Uh, but you can see lots of um, big, healthy black swallowtail cats. So most of these are on, on fennel. Uh, in the upper right, the chrysalis for these, uh, they can come in two colors. Uh, so there's brown, there's, you know, a green color. Um, and a lot of times you get, well, they were on brown, so they did brown. They were on green, so they did green. Well, a lot of times it seems to work out that way, but they're, they, they really, uh, you know, you keep tabs on it enough, they, they, they really don't know. Uh, it's probably certainly related to a survival technique based on, you know, are things going to stay green or are things going to stay brown? Uh, and then, of course, that this bottom right uh, over here, there's, um, you know, a, an early instar cat, and here's a black swallowtail egg, so. However, <laughs> if you want to try something different, uh, if you plant it, they will go. Uh, so there's uh, a variety of plants that um, are caterpillar host plants that um, grow easily in your, in your backyard. Uh, so passion vine, of course, uh, there's a tropical and native species of these, uh, the caterpillar host plant. It's actually, this is a twofer. Uh, there's two butterflies that will use this. Uh, the Gulf fertilary does uh, make its way up here. They kind of migrate up from, from the south, uh, you know, as they uh, are, are emerging in, in the warmer southern states. And they, they work their way up, even past Virginia. Uh, and I've just started, for me, a just started seeing some. Somebody had reported one about a, about a month and a half ago, and usually by mid-July, a lot of times in August, we'll see them. Uh, but I had my first one at my house the other day, buzzing around my uh, passion vine. So um, they're you know definitely around. And then of course our variegated fritillary uh, also uses passion vine. So here's golf fritillary. I'm, I'm just trying to give you examples of, you know, the egg, the caterpillar, the adult, something that, uh, you know, if you have these plants, you can kind of start looking for them. Uh, a lot of times they do lay those eggs on the little tendrils there. Um, the, uh, but they will also use the leaves, but um, this is a common spot for them to lay their eggs. Caterpillars are kind of interesting, little orange with little spikes on them there. And then this is the variegated fritillary. And that's, um, of course, I, a lot of these shots you'll see is butterflies, so they're going to be on lantana. <laughs> so uh, definitely the butterfly magnet, so for, uh, for adults. Uh, there's spice bush. I put spice bush can get pretty large. Um, and, and sassafras. Um, sassafras is, is a, a, a tree, and it can be a very large tree. Now, for me, uh, as, a, as a homeowner, um, I don't know, I don't have a lot of room for. for large trees um, are, I mean, I do have some large oaks, but you know, which are, of course, sassafras would be fine underneath. But uh, a lot of, I grow, I grow them in pots. Um, and so my uh, spice bush are all in pots. Uh, I, I know members that, uh, you know, have them growing free in, in the yard and they can get pretty good size. But again, you can, you can cut them back, trim them, do things like that. You would have to do that to a sassafras most likely, uh, especially for me when I'm trying to find um, caterpillars. So, and, and again, the importance of, of natives right here, all right? So, um, I mean, that's, that's the host plants for these guys. Uh, there's, a, there's female to the left and the male. Females, like for most of the swallowtails, not all, but the females tend to be what we call, you know, prettier. They're going to have that blue wash on the hind wings. The males will actually have a, a very pretty green. Um, that one's a little bit duller than, than many, but uh, nice, nice color. Um, shade of, of green on the male. So, 
but you'll notice that on the females there's um, little uh, markings on the very hind wing there right before the tails those are still green just like the male so that's one way to distinguish these between that and a tiger you know a, a melanistic female tiger so but um the spice fish swallowtail, the, the greatest thing about that is, is the caterpillar. So, you know, and I always have, you know, um, people say, what's your favorite butterfly? Well, that's kind of hard. Uh, what's your favorite caterpillar? Well, that's pretty easy. It's the spice fish swallowtail caterpillar. So it's just one of those things. I remember the first time I found one, I was just super, super excited. Um, but to find the young ones, you look at your plant tips and whether it's uh, sassafras or spice bush, if you see this little leaf tip that's been cut and fold it over like a little blanket, it's many times gonna contain um, that first or second instar caterpillar. As they get bigger, then they'll roll the leaves kind of like further down here, like you see in the sassafras. As they get a little larger, um, they take, they lay down silk and it causes the leaf to curl. And uh, so they tuck themselves in there, they kind of hide in there. They'll crawl out, they'll do some eating on that branch. They'll crawl back into that uh, leaf that they've made a little um, uh, place to you know, hide in. So um, look for rolled leaves like that. You probably will find the later instar caterpillars. Um, sometimes you'll open them up and yell, all you're gonna find is a spider or nothing. <laughs> so, but um, here's some other shots. These are, as the caterpillar gets a little older, it begins to um, imitate a bird dropping. And I mean, they even have a sheen on them that makes them look wet. Uh, so as they begin to mature, uh, they'll almost look like a, a wet bird dropping uh, on the leaf, you know, as they're feeding. But eventually they, you know, those late in stars are pretty neat. These are those false eye spots when it's curled up inside of the leaf. You know, if a bird were to kind of peek in there, uh, they would think, oh, oh, that's a snake. I'm, you know, not going to, not going to try to bother that. You know, something with big eyes is looking at me. Nope. Uh, and so the, you know, caterpillar lives to be able to pupate. So uh, really neat caterpillar. Um, we do have our native honeysuckles um, are the host plant for the snowberry clearwing. So it is actually a moth that um, is great in our area. Uh, Major Wheeler is uh, like the coral honeysuckle. John Clayton is uh, our, our yellow trumpet um, honeysuckle. Uh, I find them on both of these. They can still uh, the caterpillars will still eat the Japanese honeysuckle, but um, again, uh, these natives are, are just so so nice to have in your, in your yard and much more well behaved. So uh, here's the snowberry clearwing. If you've uh, never seen them, a lot of people call them bumblebee moths or hummingbird moths. Um, so there's uh, some young hatchling caterpillars there, and that's what the caterpillar looks like as it gets a little older. Now these are in the sphinx moth family, so uh, you could technically say that these are hornworms, like the tomato hornworms, all right? It's in the same family, it's a sphinx moth. You can see the little tiny horn on the uh, caterpillar there towards the end of the tail. Uh, there's also the related hummingbird clear wing. Uh, it prefers viburnums. I use the arrowwood viburnum, again, another native. Uh, eggs for these guys typically laid on top. And uh, there's the late instar caterpillar, again, another one of the hornworms. These are uh, very small sphinx moths. Um, and, you know, I would, I would always see the hummingbird clear wings. I'd see them in my yard. They'd come to Lantana and I'd see them flying around, but I never had the plant that I could find the caterpillars on. So I bought a viburnum, I put it in the yard, didn't see anything the first year. Second year, I saw a female flying and buzzing around and sure enough, I started looking and found eggs. And, and this year has been the um, same thing, bumper crop of these hummingbird clear wings for me. So pretty easy to uh, raise with the right plant. Um, cassia or a sickle pod, it's a host plant. Again, this is a, a twofer, it, uh, the cloudless sulfur and the sleepy orange. Uh, yeah, you don't, these, these plants, I mean, that, that sickle pod is a seed pod and it contains hundreds of seeds. Uh, so when it drops those seeds, I mean, they're going to pop up all over the place. So um, uh, easy enough to weed out though. It does have a kind of a, a funky smell to it if you've ever dealt with cassia. Um, but the caterpillars for these, um, you know, the, those huge yellow butterflies that you see, um, I've seen them early spring, but typically um, it's, it's later, you know, uh, later in the spring and, and early summer uh, to see the cloudless sulfurs. Um, but an interesting caterpillar with those blue on it. 
Um, the, the chrysalis, of course, uh, can be a pink or uh, green. So uh, interesting for that. And of course, sleepy orange. Actually, it, it's easier for me to find the eggs of these than it is for me to find the caterpillars. So <laughs> eggs I can find, caterpillars, they're really good at camouflaging. Pop up. All right, so one of these plants where, you know, you got one single host plant for this butterfly. Uh, so this is the zebra swallowtail. You know, it's the only host plant that, um, that they're going to be able to use. So we have a pretty healthy population of zebra swallowtails, and mostly because, uh, you know, we still have a lot of woods here. Dismal Swamp's got a lot of pawpaw. I've been to several uh, local parks, and there's a lot of pawpaw in there. So um, um, you should you should be able to attract zebras to your yard again there's there's one on lantana um you know i kind of use that as as bait you know it brings them in and then they find those host plants you know they can find them anyway but um you know they they like to nectar up and then go lay some eggs so and of course the pentas and you go well well it wasn't that just uh, one of the the nectar plants well believe it or not host plant for the tersa sphinx so there's this um Another type of sink moth here. There's the, the adult in the middle. Uh, these things almost look like, I don't know, uh, toy submarines or something, but um, pretty good caterpillar. They will decimate your pentas. So uh, a lot of times I don't even know they're there and then my pentas start to disappear or I'm seeing large pieces of frass, which is caterpillar poop. And a lot of times that's my clue that I have something there. Um, so, um, for, for finding these guys. A lot of times that's what I have to do. And you would think you'd be able to notice that, but it, they are, uh, I don't know, they're just, they're camouflaged well uh, for their design. Black cherry and tulip poplar. Well, of course, these are trees. Again, I, I actually have these in pots and I was, um, did a recent uh, Zoom with Doug Tallamy and I was saying, well, hey, you know, I grow these plants and a lot of times I like to recommend you know these these natives for people to use I said but you know they they do they are going to get big and and uh, I said you know is it all right to cut them and, he's, and so he said well yeah we call it coppicing and so it's like hey I got a new vocabulary word and um so a lot of mine I'll cut back and get them to branch and if I'm going to find caterpillars which you know that's my purpose for these trees um I you know I want to be able to see them and find them because otherwise tulip poplar is a huge tree and you know um, eventually you would never be able to see a caterpillar um tiger swallowtail uh those are the eggs now they typically uh lay eggs a single egg at a time uh I had um uh, captured a, a female put her in a temporary um uh, holding pop-up here and uh I put a tulip poplar in a pot in there. And, uh, you know, so in that case, she laid several eggs on one leaf. But uh, interesting caterpillars, again, with the fake eye spots. So, uh, a couple of the swallowtail cats do that. There's the tiger swallowtail. It's our state insect, by the way. Um, we don't have a state butterfly, but we do have a state insect. And it just happens to be a butterfly. It's the tiger swallowtail. So I think a little video here. I'm going to watch that. So. We can watch this. Uh, this is a melanistic female. The females are the only ones that can be melanistic, but typical females are going to be that yellow. But uh, it's, of course, that Brazilian verbena. So as tiny as those flowers are, that butterfly was enjoying that. But red spotted purple. Um, another beautiful butterfly has real pretty, you know, hind wings that are blue, kind of mimics a, a bit uh, like the swallowtail. And for many of these swallowtails that do have the blue hind wings are trying to mimic pipevine swallowtails, which are, are toxic because they feed on pipevine. Let me show you this little video. So red spotted pearls, this is a cherry in a pot that's in my yard. Um, you'll see this female, she'll fly around. She'll kind of, um, you know, butterflies taste with their feet. So. Uh, she's kind of test, testing and tasting those leaves and go, hmm, is this something I can lay eggs on? What the red spotted purples will do is once they decide to lay that egg that she knows this is a host plant, she'll land, she'll scoot her abdomen down to the tip of that leaf and she'll lay an egg right on the tip. And when those caterpillars hatch, well, if we look all the way over to the right, that's what they do. They begin to eat the leaf tip. And um, so you can see there's a tiny one on that very bottom leaf. And then there's probably uh, a second instar caterpillar uh, on the upper leaf. Uh, and so they'll feed like that. They'll take a lot of the debris that they have and they'll kind of uh, package it kind of behind them 
uh, on that stalk and they'll crawl out a little bit. Um, it's an interesting butterfly and caterpillar in that these caterpillars, when they're in that instar stage like that, um, they'll actually overwinter as a, as a caterpillar. They make a little hibernaculum in a cherry leaf and they overwinter in it. And of course that in the middle there, that's um, the egg to the um, red spot of purple. Oh, don't need that, just need to move on. There we go. Um, Dutchman's pipe or pipe vine. Um, again, you know, one of those plants that's, um, we, we've got natives of it. There are other different types of pipe vine out there. Um, the natives are definitely the, the best to, to get. Um, these um, also can kind of pop up. They'll, they'll act like passion vine a lot of times. Uh, you know, the, the vine will start popping up in places that you, you really don't always want it. Um, but um, beautiful, you know, leaf shape, but a fantastic butterfly. And of course, this is where the male of the butterflies is, is to me the, the, the more striking one with that beautiful, beautiful, shiny blue. It's almost like a, a tropical type of butterfly in that sense. The uh, caterpillars, I don't know, uh, kind of look like something you'd see for Halloween, kind of orange and brown and black like that, the spots. Um, so let's see, let me see how much time. Um, Alex, do we have a, a whole lot of questions or? Yeah, if you wanted to take a break, uh, we can go through some of these questions here. Uh, we've got some activity down here in the chat. All right, so it looks like we've got one, Donna Stewart, she's got a lot of Joe Pye locally on ditch banks. Is that something preferable to something that she might purchase? I mean, I'm a, I'm a Joe Pye lover. So, um, um, and, and really, you know, and don't, if, if you think, oh, well, it's just so tall and weedy looking, don't be afraid to cut it. It, it will branch for you. So, um, you know, um, for, for a, a lot of these plants, including milkweed, by the way, um, they uh, respond well to being cut by, by branching at where there's that little bracket. So they'll put it out new leaves. So and the Joe Pie is um, is good for that too. So maybe ex experiment a little bit. You know, if you say, "Well, I don't want to cut everything back." Was that your question, or what was what was it in particular? Uh, that was actually the question there. Um, also, I would just like to mention on that note, um, there's a dwarf variety out there as well, Little Joe. Um, that is a good one if you have a smaller space that you're working with. Yeah, and th and that's what I would suggest. You know, if she said, if you like the Joe Pie and you want to try some of the other species, there's Little Joe, there's Baby Joe. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, and both of those are like, uh, uh, one's probably super dwarf, you know, super dwarf and it goes 24 inches, <laughs> so, you know, but yeah, they are, they are big plants, but um, I, I like them. I like, I like seeing them. Um, We've got another going. one here. Mm -hmm. um, if zinnias are closed and they don't have stamens, are they still friendly to butterfly or butterflies? Um, well, you know, all that, all that neck is is there I mean uh, so I would probably say if there's no nectar available they're a good landing spot okay a lot of skippers will land on things you know and just kind of I guess check things out you know or even look for mates uh, so uh, so they may still use it in the sense they may not be getting any nectar out of it um, but again don't be don't be afraid to, to cut those back you might get some um, second blooms out of those same way uh, I know with the, um, the seeds that they produce, also birds, you know, are attracted to that. So. Um, we've got another one here. Um, where can you get Queen Anne's lace? Do you have a recommendation for sourcing that? <laughs> um, I mean, I'm an old guy. Uh, I used to, you know, just walk around and I saw a plant in the wild, you know, uh, along a ditch side. I used to walk along a lot of railroad tracks. I know probably dangerous nowadays, but, you know, even as a kid and it's like, oh, well, yeah, I find that's where I first saw Joe Pieweed was along railroad tracks. Um, and um, so uh, there are some places, you know, where it'll grow wild. I don't think too many places generally carry it because, you know, it is so, so common. Um, occasionally, you know, at some of the butterfly society sales, you know, I'll occasionally I'll pot some up, you know, and I'll have it out there, but, uh, you know, it's again, for most, most people, um, they, they can dig it up and, and, um, transfer it oh, and, or those heads. I mean, those, those, uh, those flower heads, I mean, when they're closed and they're all, they're full of seeds. So, <laughs> 
um, it, you know, you don't have to dig up the plant, just wait for it to go to seed and um, cut off some of those seed heads and, and try it out in some, some pots or a little area of your yard. Um, but be careful, because again, they're, they're, that's how they do multiply. So um, Queen Anne's lace can take over. It's, um, you know, it's Queen Anne's lace has probably been in our country <laughs> since, you know, the settlers arrived. I, I, it's, it's not a native, but it's been, it's been here for so long. A lot of people think it's a native. So, um, but um, I mean, look, look how just in the picture, I haven't run this video yet, but you can see how it just stands out. This beautiful flat white flower. So um, it's great. What else we got? Let's see. Um, I believe we had an answer here in the chat, but could you just clarify um, that the aphids on the milkweed will not eat the butterfly eggs? Uh, yeah, the aphids are only interested in the sap, um, you know, so they're, they're uh, you know, sap feeders are, yeah, in huge numbers, they are a problem, you know, most of the time I, I just kind of, you could see, you saw in those pictures I had, I mean, I had aphids all over the leaves and I saw caterpillars there. Um, so, yeah, typically the aphids won't, but lots of other things will eat butterfly egg, uh, ants. Uh, a lot of a lot of a lot of wasps are really your enemy for a caterpillar. I mean, there are a lot of wasps that hey for their life cycle they depend on caterpillars, just like birds depend on caterpillars. You know, so um, it's it's caterpillars are a very very important part of the ecosystem, um, and so uh, planting for them, you know, hey you're you're helping the ecosystem. All right, so that, you know, wasps take your caterpillars. Well, you know, it's it's not really a bad thing <laughs> so um and again i I'm, I'm just real big on biodiversity you know so i i'd like i like to go outside and you know be able to count 50 different species of insect in an hour and i can do that at certain places so um i like them all so but that's that's you know good question yeah what else so we have another one um since penta is not native to virginia what are the native plants that the tarsus sphinx will also use or host on you know, um, I'd have to look up and see if this was introduced, but they feed on buttonweed, and it's that awful weed that looks weird and yellow with an elongated leaf. It's real short and it grows in your lawn. They will eat buttonweed. Uh, I'll have to see if that's in there, and then I'll have to I'll have to double check and see if if Tursa was actually introduced in it because we do have moths that because their plant was introduced, the moths came right along with it. Um, I don't think that's certainly not the uh, the case for pentas. Um, so I've also looked up with the Tirsa Sphinx, it does say, you know, the broadleaf buttonweed, but also uh, Catalpa. Okay, uh, so there you go. So Catalpa, I mean, there is a Catalpa Sphinx also. Uh, uh, Catalpa, if you're not familiar with that, um, we have several uh, in our area, uh, Catalpa trees. I'm sure you have some at MBG, right, Alex? Oh yeah, yep. Yeah. We've got a handful of those guys. Yeah, and um, so there you go, uh, and 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 Catalpa would be um, the host plant for that. So they they've just been able to, um, you know, through through luck and introduction of those plants, uh, find another food source. So it looks like I've got um, two more questions here so far, uh, more plant centric. Um, from your experience, is it easy to grow Joe pie weed from seeds? Have you done that before? Um. You know, I, I've never tried to, um, a, a lot of seeds you have to, you know, a strike and you have to you know, put them in a refrigerator for a certain amount of time for some seeds. Um, you know, that's what they say to do even for milkweed seeds. Um, so, you know, a really, really cool temperatures for a long period of time. Uh, and maybe that's what takes to trigger it. Uh, I have had Joe pie come up around my other Joe pie. So I know, they can germinate from seed and it's not from a runner or anything. Um, so I, I have gotten them that way, but I've never tried to, to grow them myself from seed. So, so it's, <laughs> it's, it's available enough that for me, you know, you know, it's, it's like, I don't know, I, I, I'm not gonna grow my own tomatoes either. <laughs> so I'm, I'm gonna always buy that started plant. I mean, I used to, but nowadays I'm like, eh, you know, I'm gonna get the head start. And we have uh, another question. Um, it's actually it ties exactly into what you mentioned, planting milkweed seeds. Can you explain cold stratification? Um, that I can say uh, is it requires about 30 days of those cold temperatures for that milkweed. So if you wanted to stratify at home, you could just put them on a wet paper towel in a Ziploc bag 
in the fridge and they need a minimum of 30 days in the cold. Um, and that is something that would prevent them in nature in from germinating in like unfavorable conditions. Um, if that clarifies that one. And then lastly, um, this one's just regarding the Zoom guys. Uh, the, the sign on for tonight um, is not going to be valid for tomorrow's sign on. So we will be sending out another link tomorrow for um, tomorrow and the Friday night sign on. Each day has a different login link. And that looks well, like- Yeah, yeah, because you have to sign up all separately yep. too. Yeah. yeah, so that looks like the last of the questions for now. Okay, all right. Well then, good, I got, I got a little treat for you. Um, so I, several years ago, um, I you know, had an idea. I said, man, I, I wanna put in a butterfly garden at my school at Virginia Beach. Went to my principal and said, hey, you know, I got an idea. You know, we got these rain gardens. They're not really being used. You know, the city had some plantings there of, uh, you know, a couple of odds and ends of, 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 of daylilies more than anything. And I said, you know, I, I, I want to try this out. So, uh, and then I thought, okay, well, I can get, you know, the public involved. And I contacted the um, uh, Boy Scouts and uh, the Tidewater Council. And I said, hey, you know, I'm looking for some, you know, Eagle Scouts. I think I got an idea for a project that somebody could do, you know, I, I need somebody to do some work, you know, to, I, I have the plan, I just need somebody to make it come to fruition. And um, so I, they gave me um, one of the scout troops locally at, at the church near uh, Virginia Beach Middle School. And I could tell when that scout master had told those scouts, you know, hey, I got an idea for it, because I had five emails, boom, 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 <laughs> uh, about 730 at night. So I, I took the first one and it just so happened to be a scout that uh, went to Virginia Beach Middle School. So I think he was a freshman at the time uh, from there. And um, so they spent, I mean, I think they thought, oh, you know, we'll be out there, you know, for a little, an hour or two on Saturday. They were there most of the day. Uh, I mean, they tilled, uh, we had, I had, uh, this, this was before I was really big into the butterfly site. I had members out there show me you know, give me ideas, what would be good to plant, where to plant it. You know, I showed them the area before I even, you know, got any shovel in the ground. Uh, so they, they tilled, worked, fertilized, um, you know, um, learned how to plant the plants. And they, they learned a lot about butterfly gardening. Um, so uh, I think now this garden is on its seventh year. Uh, and, um, you know, it's, it's, it's all about time for your plants to mature. So let's see. Let me run this. This this will probably last about seven minutes, and I'm I'm talking through it, so um, it kind of guides you as to what I'm doing. And you'll probably hear some of the things I've already talked to you about. But here we go. Just to interject here, I'm not sure if when the audio may um, be jumping in or if it started, um, but we are getting a few messages that the audio is not um, not available.
Um, Alex, you were saying the video, the audio wasn't working. Yeah, unfortunately, we couldn't hear the audio come through. Um, could barely hear a little, little bit in the background there, but uh, uh, not the okay. audible. Yeah, let me. Uh, all right, maybe I can. Um, let me try something. Let's see. If, let's see if this will do any better. Um, we can try it if you don't mind. <laughs> so let's see. Maybe this will work better. Let me know. Any better or no? Unfortunately, still not coming through. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Um, yeah, I don't know. Let me see. Well, what about that? Doesn't matter. It must be on a different thing. So does that? Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> that's all right. Um, I was trying to pause it. Um, so yeah, so what, well, what, basically what it is, I'm, I'm walking along and uh, like, again, I'm, I'm talking about, you know, you can kind of see this garden um, for how it is. So I'm gonna just go up to where I was for um, the asters. Um, but you can see the variety of plants that I have there. Uh, here are some of the new plants. It's Faltonia, it's a native, uh, it's false aster. Um, so I'm, I'm, you know, I'm gonna talk about that a little bit. Um, and so let's just go ahead and let it roll from here. All right. So that's a large spice bush there. Just to pause you, um, I think you have to go back one more slide. Um, we are actually viewing the um, finding oh, eggs slide. Are we still on the other one? Yeah, it's still um, on the ah. slide that says finding eggs in your yard. All right, hang on. Um, all right, let me see. Uh, right, I have that PowerPoint here. So it's, you think it's still playing from the PowerPoint? Or do we now, let me see. Let me, I'll tell you what, let me, I'm gonna exit out of that. Is something else still playing? Oh, I stopped the sharing there, so hang on. Now there's no video. Okay. Um, let me go back to screen share. Sorry for the technology things. You know, those are things is like it's working on, on my end. What about now? Yep. Now it's there. You can see the screen and there's nothing else playing, right? Uh, nope. Okay. All right. So um, this should, let's, let, yeah, let's try it and see if it'll work. So it's playing. Okay. But you can't hear anything, right? Yeah, no audio, unfortunately. Oh, okay. Well, I'll, I'll narrate as we go then. So if you can't hear anything, I'm not talking over anything. So that'll be good. All right, so I can do that. So um, there's that Joe Pie. You can see how tall that is. So, bee balm, very tall. Um, I actually got uh, students planted that. For, we did a uh, wetlands in the classroom program with Lynn Haven River now. So there's one side of the garden. And I actually started adding a couple of more things over here. Notice that goldenrod, I have a Phragmites problem, as you can see, well, the goldenrod seems to kind of keep it at bay. There's a nice little pawpaw. Threw a pipe vine in, it's very young. And that's the Virginia snake root is also a native uh, host plant for the pipe vine. That's that smaller plant. So it's basically two berms, you know, of, of a rain garden. Um, so walking to the other side, they do mowing there. Um, I, I, they're real good about contacting me before doing anything. And a lot of times I can, um, flag things off. Um, you know, I have a spice, spice bush again on the corner there, and a little corner lantana. You can see a mixture there, Joe Pie in common. Mountain mint, 
once you get that started, again, it's pretty easy to dig up and maintain and give away. So look at that goldenrod in the background and look at the Phragmites behind it. So we've been working with keeping that, that goldenrod spreading and going outward like that. And uh, we'll walk in there, we'll trim out some of the Phragmites, but um, if, if I didn't have that there, I mean, and Phragmites even pops up in the butterfly garden. So um, that invasive reed, um, it's, it's a constant battle. But um, so we're trying to experiment a little bit with, you know, what can I use as a, as a, as a native, as a barrier, as, a, as another plant? And um, Goldenrod's doing a pretty good job with it. Uh, nice purple cone flower. Um, I'll have uh, goldfinches show up for that. So that's a that's a prickly ash. It actually grows pretty big, pretty fast. But it's the host plant for the giant swallowtail. And three years ago, I had one show up and was able to raise the caterpillars. So uh, that that plant there is the, the blue mist flower. It's our you know, wild azuratum. Another species of goldenrod. That's the fireworks. Stays shorter. So again, the sedum I like because it's a late bloomer. So that's some young uh, milkweed. Some false nettle, I put that in about a year ago. Uh, that's for Red Admiral, so more cone flower. There's some more sedum, another type of sedum there. So, so there's the zinnias, they actually came up from seed from last year, so. So there's passion vine. I'm just waiting to find golf fritillaries there. I haven't seen any yet on there, but it'll happen. So a little more goldenrod there. So there's another spice bush. I find quite a few caterpillars on that one. There's the Zizi I was talking about. That's Golden Alexander. Stays nice and short. So. And that's the uh, Chapel Hill Lantana. Like I say, it tends to stay uh, shorter than the Miss Huff. Um, and there's a nice papa growing in full sun. So, uh, and I find Zebra swallowtail, cats on there, and, and eggs, uh, lots of times. So there you go. <laughs> so uh, again, a good mix, you know, uh, it's native and non-native. Um, so uh, you ever get a chance there, uh, check it out. It's it's a Pretty neat place. And there's typically, it was a windy day there, so you didn't see too much for butterflies flying around. Uh, it was actually kind of hard to um, do a recording where I didn't have a jet flying over. <laughs> when I was trying to make the first one, I was talking and I was like, oh gosh, nobody could hear me. So uh, for us, eh, I self narrated. But so that's so weird. It didn't, did not work like that. So um, let me stop my share here. So, all right. Um, well, any other questions come in or anything, Alex? Yeah, so I've got a few here. Um, who did the plant signs for the garden? Uh, gosh, I'll have to find the company. Um, you know, again, I, I try, I, we, we've done a lot of other cool things with the students. I'm actually at Princess Anne Middle now. I, I uh, switched schools, but that, that garden is still my baby. And they're saying, what are you going to do at Princess Anne? It's like, uh, if I do anything there, it's going to be an eight by eight raised bed because it's a lot of work to do that. Uh, <laughs> that garden and I actually have a lot of uh, volunteers of people that have been walking or biking down the, the path there that have said hey you need help and I'm like uh, 
yeah. So I've got a, I've got a crack crew that comes out and I mean, I have a guy that, that mulches, a guy that will get in there and just go after that Phragmites. I mean, so um, lot, lots of great help with it. Um, so the, um, you know, what, and what, what was your question again for that? I just said, uh, who made the plant signs? Oh, oh so the signs I did, um, it was actually what they call a capstone project at the Brickell Academy. So I was doing a, a talk for the city about, hey, doing pollinator gardens. And somebody said, hey, you know, is there anything we can do? I said, you know, I'd really like to get some plant science. So these, uh, you know, it was like four students. They came over, they um, talked to me, they got information. I told them what plants I wanted to do. I, I gave them, you know, the, the scientific name and I gave them a little bit of research. They did a lot of the research, sent it into this company. The company said, oh, well, we kind of have some standard science for that, but we can add other things to it. And that's how those signs got made and put in there. And they are very nice. So, and I've been using this for about three years now. So. Got another question here. Um, any goldenrod or specific variety to hold back the Phragmites? Um, I don't know what the variety is. And I, I think it was originally planted by the city. So I could probably, you know, find out. But that, that taller variety, uh, the one that's actually doing well in the rain garden, I mean, it's, it's the one to have. But I am not sure of the species. Of it. I don't know if it's the uh, Canadian goldenrod or canadensis. That's a possibility. I was trying to look it up one time and pin it down. There are lots of different um, species of, of goldenrod. So um, I actually have three different species out there. So I will say that canadensis, so we had that in the children's garden. That does hold its own, especially against, like you said, Phragmites, the cattails. It's pretty, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. pretty aggressive grower there. And it's about, it's, that's the right height there for it. Um, yeah. But it looks like that's wrapping it up for the questions there we have so far. Uh, most of it's just compliments on that amazing garden that you showed us. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks. Yeah, I, I haven't even been looking at the chat. I'd get too distracted. So, um, but yeah, always good to hear. And, and um, yeah, you know, check it out. Check it out sometime. Uh, it is, uh, um, it's a Monarch Way station, of course. We got that, you know, the following year. Um, so, um, you know, meets all, meets all the criteria for that. And I mean, and that is something you can do at your home too. So my yard is also a Monarch Way station. So uh, you can contact Monarch Watch and um, they will um, hook you up. <laughs> yeah. Very cool. All right. All right, and yep, that looks like it's uh, wrapped it up there for the questions for us. All right, well, good. Yeah, I'm looking at the chat. Well, everybody is welcome. I'm. I'm you know, uh, hopefully you were able to walk away with something, maybe a little inspired to try something different uh, in your yard. Yeah, and we, you know, we appreciate you taking the time to do this presentation for us. Uh, we appreciate you guys tagging in here, uh, joining us on this uh, virtual butterfly festival. Again, it's the first year that we've done this and we've gotten a pretty great response there. So um, the Butterfly Society, just huge hats off to you guys for helping us support are helping support us in this endeavor. Uh, just a reminder, we have free programs tomorrow night and Friday night. And additionally, um, not butterfly related, but we have more free programs running through the month of October to complement Washed Ashore. So definitely recommend you guys go to the website, check that out. Uh, there's a lot of good stuff headed your way the rest of the month. So thank you all for tuning in. And there will be a follow-up email. Um, including the link to this video this evening, which will also be posted on our website. All right. Have a great evening, everyone. Thank you so All much. All right. You're welcome. Bye.